Gavin Ellis, good morning to you. Good morning, Catherine. Right, plenty to talk about. Where should we start? Yeah. Well, let's start with a, a, a report that was released this morning. Um, it's a report funded by the, the, the Law Foundation, carried out by uh, a couple of researchers, Tom Barraclough and Curtis Barnes, who run a, a research company called Brainbox. Um, an unusual and perhaps perplexing title, Perception Inception is the name of the study. Uh, what it's about is uh, deep fakes. Now, I think somewhat erroneously they they blame media for, for lumping everything into the, the, the deep fake title, all forms of disinformation. Now, I think headline writers might do that, but journalists know that deep fakes are, in fact, just one subset of the broader subject of, of disinformation. What the study is looking at, and in a very, very focused and um, granular way, Catherine, because it goes into immense detail, uh, not only about what what are deep fakes, but also the examination of the laws that we have in New Zealand and their ability to uh, to cope with, with this new phenomenon, which, of course, relates to... Um, the digital capturing of of vision, v- visual images and and uh, audio uh, sound, and then the the misappropriation or the manipulation of that to create something that that in fact is not uh, not real. Now we can go into the semantics of what is reality in a digital image anyway, because it, in many cases it automatically gets enhanced and improved. Uh, in your iPhone or camera or whatever, but leave that aside. What we're really talking about here is the the misappropriation of of digital images and sound, uh, and they they have determined that um, we should resist rushing into new laws to try and cope with this. Now, for most people. When we talk about deep fakes, they think of that. You remember the uh, few months ago, or it might be a year ago now, um, some researchers created a uh, in a fake interview with uh, um, Barack Obama, in which it looked like he was saying what he was saying, but in fact, uh, not only was his image manipulated, but the sounds that came out of his mouth were entirely recreated. And I think that's the sort of thing that we think of when we we think of deep fakes. Um, And, of course, the potential for it to be misused is is very real. But um, as Tom Barraclough and and Curtis Barnes point out, uh, there are many, many uses of digital manipulation that are either quite valid. You know, we don't want to have laws, for example, that uh, that stop wet a workshop doing what it does. Uh, some of them are harmless. And a, a small subset of of, uh, of these deep fakes may, in fact, be, be harmful. But they did a, a rigorous analysis, I think, of, of the laws that we have now and their ability to, to cope with this emerging uh, form of artificial intelligence and or use of artificial intelligence, uh, they found that we have at least 16 current acts of parliament and formal guidelines. And by formal guidelines, they mean things like um, the Statement of Principles by the New Zealand Media Council uh, or the BSA's standards and so on, Broadcasting Standards Authority standards. So we've got 16 ways in which we can... We can uh, control or give redress, perhaps a better way of looking at it, uh, to to people affected by, by this phenomenon. Um, but what they do find, and they, they say that in, in most respects they would uh, not even, they would resist even changing the laws that we have. They make one or two suggestions for uh, where the law might be um, Revised slightly to take account of some of the more nuanced aspects of of uh, of the phenomenon, but they say what we really do need to do uh, is to get all of the people responsible for these various pieces of of legislation, sit them down, and decide who is going to be responsible for what in terms of dealing with uh, the aftermath of uh, the misuse of um, of these manipulated images and sounds. They also believe that 
the public needs to be made made much much more aware of just what we might be dealing with in the in the future um, and and I think that they're they're absolutely right, but where they come from, I think is the the balancing act you know that we've got to be really careful that in coping with with an emerging phenomenon and it is still emerging um, we don't uh, create unintended consequences now you know what would happen to wet a workshop for example could be an unintended consequence of trying to deal with the harmful aspects of uh, vi- visual manipulation um, so they say that we've you know we've got to strike balances, we've got to publicise the matter. Uh, we need to consider how good are we at digital forensic services. In other words, um, the government and the tech sector, uh, their ability to actually recognise and detect this sort of misuse of, of digital technology. But they go further than, they, further than that. They say that, you know, because we, we look to... Um, by many as a as a sort of a, a great laboratory for um, uh, you know regulatory change for social change and so on because of our size and and demographics and so on that we also have the potential um, to develop uh, these forensic services uh, for export that we could actually um, sell them to an international market if we uh, if we develop them uh, appropriately and uh, uh, and to the right degree. Now, what they're saying is that, uh, you know, the, these things could be um, of use to, to uh, uh, lawyers and, and the courts in future because they're looking at it from an evidential point of view. You know, it's not just detecting it, but they're looking at what laws would have been broken by... Um, by what's been done to uh, to this, they also are very very mindful and devote a lot of the the report um, to issues of privacy. Now, one of the unfortunate things about New Zealand is that uh, we have a very very small body of case law on on privacy matters, you know, locally derived case law. Uh, so they they really are dealing with a fairly narrow um, set of cases on which to. Uh, to make some some uh, determinations, but nonetheless, they do um, point out that there are real issues relating to personal privacy that may need to be thought through, and certainly may need to be communicated by the privacy commissioner to the public. Similarly, with copyright protection, um, the um, video censorship, and so on, uh, and also an ongoing legal analysis that needs to be done. Uh, I think it's a very, very useful report, Catherine, and they they themselves say it's a first step, and I think they're right, that we need to now take their recommendations, particularly those related to sitting down and saying, well, who's get, who does what and why and in what circumstances, so that they develop a framework uh, for dealing with this, this issue in the future. Now, what they're careful to say is, don't rush into sure. a deep fake law because it will have unintended consequences. Sure. Okay, now who has had 50 years in the press gallery? Our old mate, and you and I, you and I both know Colin James. Um, Colin James, who I regard as, as one of our best uh, political analysts, chalked up 50 years in the parliamentary press gallery uh, a week or so ago, and uh, he wrote a piece in the Otago Daily Times on Saturday about his his fifty years. Now, when he 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 started, um, we didn't have the sort of level of security uh, that we have now. I don't know whether it was the case when you were in the gallery, uh, Catherine, but when I was there, we didn't have security guards; we had messengers. You remember those Correct. old fellows yes. that used to <laughs> wonder. Seemingly aimlessly around the building, but um, uh, we had messengers. But that was when he started. He started in the Holyoke era and really at what he calls the Clark pivot, uh, sorry, the Kirk pivot um, between the the sort of certainties of the Holyoke age and certainties of policy and so on, um, leading up to through the Kirk pivot and then the the Muldoon populism to uh, the massive changes of the... 
the Longy Douglas uh, era. Now, the piece that he wrote in the in the ODT was was characteristically uh, analytical because he didn't just look back; he he looked forward and he looked to the ability of Jacinda Ardern to uh, to be transformational, um, to be in in the one move. Um, a pivot point and a transformational uh, leader. Now he doesn't he doesn't say yes she can. What he uh, what he says is that um, you know history doesn't repeat itself or seldom repeats itself, even if it sometimes appears to. So how she lives in history is going to be for somebody else who has 50 sure. years in the press gallery Remarkable. to determine. It is. Yeah, it's a great, a great innings. A great innings. Just a couple of minutes left. Yeah. Uh, we've covered the Australian election result in some detail in politics, but yeah. this, uh, the media coverage is, is getting a bit... Uh, well, it's always, oh, isn't well, it? The, yeah, but the, I mean, the, the, the Murdoch press, just quickly, wearing its, its heart on its sleeve. Uh, on Monday, the Australian's heading was Messiah from the Shire with a... a a triumphal picture of uh, uh, of Scott Morrison this morning, ScoMo Mojo, uh, crediting mm. him with a rise in the, uh, uh, the the share market. But this morning, with an unfortunate picture of of uh, Shorten uh, carrying some groceries in, into his house, uh, very prominent was. A packet of rice bubbles. There you go. <laughs> hey, I just wanted to mention that earlier study uh, was funded by the New Zealand uh, Law yes, Foundation. Said, did yes, you mention I, that? I Thank you for that. that. Um, um, and just a, less than a minute left. Uh, yeah, well, Voyager Media Awards, some yeah, of the top ones. Yeah, let's let's give a. Uh, well, I was going to say bouquets, but this is going to take the entire uh, florist shop because there were sixty-three awards handed out to to journalists last Friday. Uh, at the Voyager Media Awards, and I'd give bouquets to the finalists and to the winners because, you know, journalism has a lot of problems in this country, depleted newsrooms, so on, but we do have oases of exceptionally sure. good journalism. I've got to say a big shout-out to a couple of colleagues, Phil Pennington and to Catherine Hutton uh, yeah. for their awards. Phil Pennington, Reporter of the Year. I hope I've probably missed out some other RNZers. But, oh, look, um, there, were, there were so many that yep. I, I hesitated to, 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 to mention names. out any, so I've given bouquets to all of them. All right. Hey, thanks very much. Gavin Ellis, Media Commentator. 